All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, good night, everybody. Welcome to Cuba Accelerator Program for Early Stage Startup on Precision Medicine. My name is Michael, and I'm a lead, lead, uh, leader of the program. Uh, tonight is our fourth event. Uh, first of all, let's uh, welcome Dan, our Director of Marketing and BD, to give a brief, brief introduction of the program. Dan? Okay. Okay, sure. Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. So first, let me share my screen. I have a simple slides to share with you guys. So, okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome in, in the fourth webinar in our accelerator program. My name is Dan Zhang. I'm the director of marketing and BD at QV Center. So first of all, I'd like to give you a, a brief introduction of QV Center. So Cube was founded in September 2018. We are a Silicon Valley based flat platform to connect and support innovation and entrepreneurship with a mission of platform and investment and services. Oh, uh, excuse me. So could you mute yourself if you are now speaking? Thank you. Uh, so with a mission of platform and investment or, and services, Cubay is designed as an innovative business, business model which combines real property, business exhibition, financial activity, technology cooperation, business services, and startup incubation. So besides Silicon Valley, we also set up our innovation centers in global, including Israel, Australia, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, and we are going to launch our sites in uh, Toronto and, and Mexico in the near future. So every, co every company in our platform has the access to our global platform. So this August, we launched the first startup accelerator program. This program aims to help promising startups scale efficiently and effectively in the global market. During the first program, the selected startups will get all the resources needed for their development through Cubay platform, including free office space, mentor training, VC connections, pitch opportunities, and service credit from our partners. So recently, we are hosting the bi-weekly webinars to connect our mentors and startups. If you are interested in joining our future events, please feel free to follow up our social media platform. And if you have any questions for our speaker today, uh, please feel free to, to post them in the chat section. Also, our team is more than willing to connect you with you. We have Michael, who is our lead of program operations, Lucy and Sam from our intern team. I hope you enjoy the event tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction of Cube. Again, we are a very new organization and welcome to support us more. Okay, uh, let's get it started. Tonight, we have two talks, one from our program mentor, John Dowling, and uh, one from N1 Life, which is a startup company. Uh, first of all, uh, let's uh, let me give a brief introduction about our mentor, John, John Dowling. John is a professor of uh, neurosciences at Harvard University, a very fam famous neuroscientist in vision science. Uh, he was elected to National Academy of Sciences in 1976. Uh, he has a lot of contributions on uh, biochemistry on, uh, of, of uh, Rob Dobson and the development of uh, ver uh, uh, vertebrate retina, as well as the disease that affect the vision, such as uh, vitamin A deficiency. In addition to his contribution to academia, he started Aldexa Therapeutics in 2004, which, de uh, which develops treatment for dry form of age-related uh, macular gen uh, uh, degeneration eye disease uh, that may lead to blindness. Uh, he is going to talk about it later. Um, John, you, you there? Oh, uh, <laughs> Uh, by the way, uh, t uh, tonight's event is going to be uh, live streaming on Facebook and YouTube, so uh, people are also watching there too. Uh, John, you should probably have the full control now. Excuse me, I missed that. Oh, you're, I'm all set to go? <laughs> yeah, floor is yours. 
Okay, well, thank you very much and good evening, everyone. And this evening, what I would like to do are two things. First, describe to you the scientific rationale behind our therapeutic that led us, and us was Tom Jordan, a former student of mine and myself, to found our biotech startup, we called it Neuron Systems, almost 15 years ago. Now, I'm assuming that not many of you know much about visual mechanisms or the disease that we set out to deal with. And that disease is age-related macular degeneration. So I will describe all of this in some detail. Then I will discuss what happened to the company and where we are today. There are lessons to be learned from both parts of the story. Now again, the disease we set out to attack, age-related macular degeneration, is today the major cause of legal blindness in the West, if not in the entire world. It results in the loss of high acuity vision so that in age-related macular degeneration, one cannot read, one cannot see faces, recognize faces, watch television, drive, any of the things that we take for granted and our vision is so important. Now, what's going on in age-related macular degeneration is that there's a loss of a small part of the retina get back in in the next half hour. Sure, no, no problem. Okay. Uh, hi, Janice, are you with us? Uh -huh. Hi, Janice, oh, yes. you're, you're on mute, okay. Um, sure, uh, because uh, some te te technical problems, so I'll probably uh, start with N1 Live right now. Is it okay? Yeah. Um, sure. Okay, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of introduction about uh, N1 Life. It's a uh, startup, and uh, they're working on uh, de uh, developing new therapeutic therap uh, strategies against the resistant diseases through the better uh, de uh, delivery technology, which I believe are spin out from Stanford. And the technology helps to deliver uh, the delivery of small molecule drugs uh, through the biological uh, barriers uh, like BBB, skin resistant cancer cells, and bacteria bio, uh, biofilms. They also develop a, a, bio, a, a, a polymer based technology for the delivery of gene therapeutics for uh, various diseases, including cancer. Um, so tonight, Janice is going to talk about it. Janice, you should be good to go. You have the full control now. Okay, uh, let me see if I can share. Uh, can you see my? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's truly my uh, great pleasure and honor to be here to talk to you uh, today on behalf of N1 Life. I'm the CEO of N1 Life. My name is Janice. Uh, so N1 Life is a star uh, startup company based in Silicon Valley. As um, uh, John just, I'm just uh, introduced, we are uh, spin out from Stanford. We are founded by Stanford uh, scientists and some industry leaders. Uh, right now, we're working on some very important um, uh, important uh, topics for the pharmaceutical field. So uh, our goal is to overcome some barriers and delivering cure and hope to the patients. How the, re the way we do that is um, the company is based on a technology platform. We call it N1 Delivery Platform. And we establish this ecosystem with uh, based on this platform using a peptide-based delivery technology. And we now have several programs in our um, ecosystem. First, we can use our technology to uh, serve other clients and partners as a service. And from this uh, platform technology, we also uh, generate our therapeutic program, veterinary uh, medicine program, non-therapeutic program, and other projects. And with this technology and our program, we are able to really um, bring some par uh, paradigm shift to the pharmaceutical industry. 
right now with our technology, we will be able to really reduce the development time by forty uh, percent. So right now only sixty percent um, the length of uh, the development time, and also we really cut the cost. We only need to use twenty five percent of the original development cost. Sometimes when you uh, hear about drug development, that refers to really billions of dollars and maybe over 10 years of time. Now we really bring something new to the uh, field. And also uh, we anticipate one to two IND candidates uh, each year in the future. And we will submit our first IND um, in 2021. So um, as I mentioned, uh, at the very beginning, we are uh, looking at these biological barriers, and this might be new to some of you, this term. Uh, and when you think about uh, tree barks, eggshells, and our skin, these are all biological barriers. But when we talk about drugs, um, when they enter our body, there are so many uh, bi biological barriers in the micro world. Um, these are all these diagrams. You can see we have blood green barriers, uh, mucous barriers, skin barriers, and most importantly, our plasma membrane barriers. All of these barriers really play a very important role for our life. They really protect us. They maintain the basic structure of our body. But when it comes to therapeutics, they somehow stops the um, therapeutic from getting to where they, they really need to go. For example, tumor or inflammation, inflammation sites or infections. Uh, so, I just uh, put a quote here from Nature Biotechnology. Uh, this is a very prestigious um, uh, journal. Um, so basically, drug molecules simply diffuse and distribute freely throughout our body. And this results in undesirable side effects and limiting achievement of proper dose required to bring about efficacious responses. The inability to reach target sites contributes to exceptionally high attrition attrition rates of new chemical entities, which are the new drug candidates, and very low um, successful rate for drug development. So basically, even though um, patients are taking medicines or in, uh, in real life and clinical trials, only very small percentage of the drugs that uh, enter our body, body get to where it should go and um, make them uh, effect. So um, with this, uh, just in summary, this is, uh, comes down to a failed and very limited drug entry to um, where they should be sometimes inside cells, sometimes inside a tissue or tumor. And there are uh, numerous efforts on this uh, uh, issue and the industry have been uh, trying to develop drug delivery system, trying to conquer this problem. For example, uh, people have developed um, antibody drug conjugate, lipid nanoparticles, viral particles, and polymers. And they, um, there are over 50 of these drug delivery systems have been uh, approved by FDA, and they are used. They are being used um, in the clinic right now to help patients. Um, the most uh, successful uh, drug delivery system could be the uh, can, it is the antibody drug conjugate. Um, U.S. being the most important important market and also the um, development force. There are many pharmaceutical companies right now uh, in the U.S. that are developing uh, antibody drug conjugates for as new therapeutics. And 61% um, percent of all the clinical trials and pipelines of antibody drug conjugates are in the U.S. And um, in the past um, decades, um, there are several uh, antibody drug conjugates that have been approved by, um, by FDA. Um, you can see almost every year um, there are some being approved and these have been uh, shown to uh, be very effective in patients. Uh, and there's a very uh, a significant growth uh, is anticipated uh, in the market for antibody drug conjugate. However, um, there are some limitations about uh, antibody drug conjugate. For example, because the antibody drug conjugate is super, super, super huge, um, in, uh, is some, it's around uh, 100 of thousand of Dalton um, can, or even more. And this large size have uh, 
resulted in penetration problems because they're so big, they cannot overcome the biological barriers. They cannot enter um, the cells, they cannot enter organ, they cannot enter um, uh, tumor. And they also brought a um, problem of immunogenicity because they're large particles. They're, uh, ex they're, uh, they're, they are from the outside of our body. So we, uh, our immune system may recognize them and think they are something bad and they could aggregate. And also, very importantly, these uh, antibody drug conjugate, um, it's very, can be very challenging to synthesize and manufacture on a large scale. And uh, alternatively, there are other therapeutic uh, options. Um, for example, there are peptides which are really small uh, compared to antibody drug, uh, antibody, antibodies and proteins. And, um, but uh, maybe, uh, some, some, uh, somewhat bigger than the small molecules which are traditionally used as therapeutics. And um, we have, uh, people have developed a, pro a peptide drug conjugate uh, in comparison to antibody drug conjugates and realized that peptide drug conjugate can really emphasize, uh, can really address some of the uh, drawbacks and disadvantages of antibody drug conjugates. As I listed here, some of the, um, uh, comparison between peptide drug conjugate and antibody drug conjugate. As I mentioned, antibody drug conjugate can have very poor tissue penetration, uh, tumor penetration, and um, can be very expensive and very uh, challenging to manufacture. And also because they're, the nature of the uh, molecule is huge, is uh, uh, is, it's hard to synthesize. So there's really very limited space for optimizing. So for example, sometimes people just want to change a small uh, feature of this molecule or to make it more, uh, more um, effective or less toxic. It's hard to do this type of manipulation. And also, um, as I mentioned, there is immunogenicity problem and um, can cause some metabolism problem. But all of these um, can be really improved by using peptide um, as the delivery vehicle. And this is an emerging field actually um, which we call peptide drug conjugate PDC. So uh, peptide drug conjugate is, um, this is just uh, a cartoon diagram uh, we made. Uh, so peptide is, uh, and one life uh, uh, te technology is based on this type of uh, uh, peptide. So uh, basically we use a peptide as a delivery transporter and use a linker to connect with the drug and then this um, peptide drug conjugate can be used as a new therapeutic candidate. And we believe that we see, and we believe um, this is, uh, will be true uh, in the uh, in actual clinical uh, setting that uh, these peptide drug conjugates really provide high efficacy and um, low toxicity, and of course, better penetration because of the nature of peptides. And very importantly, because um, the synthesis and manufacture of peptides is much easier and very uh, mature, like the industry is very mature. So we really will have a uh, cost-effective manufacturing process for, uh, uh, for the uh, drugs in the future. And um, as I mentioned, this is an emerging field. There are many uh, new, comp new and um, mature companies uh, in the field right now. These are just some examples I picked out. Um, Antrada is, uh, 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 is a US company. They have raised, raised uh, over $50, 000, $50 million. And uh, all these companies have raised a lot of money. And um, just thinking, uh, you taking um, no, 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 uh, as an example, they are really making an impact using uh, peptide uh, drug conjugate, they are using it for uh, stroke and they're helping so many people. They're already in phase three and they have very good results from phase three clinical trial. Um, Peptid Dream is a company in Japan. They have signed uh, several significant partnership deals with companies like, like Novartis. Uh, this is uh, telling us that the big, uh, the, big gi uh, the giants of the industry uh, are recognizing how important and how um, and um, and the potential of peptide drug conjugate and um, they are uh, really uh, investing in this field. Um, and um, 
So I just ha I put this slide out. I think this is a good uh, slide to compare or to make uh, a, to make and people and uh, my audience understand why uh, we think N1 Life can play a big role in this field and really make a paradigm shift for uh, the drug development field. So we actually compared our technology with the one that's used in NO and O uh, trials. Um, so the uh, this is already in phase three clinical trial, so we know it's very promising. So we um, took that and connect with some uh, reporter to uh, so we can monitor how well they behave. Uh, and this is in this is a cell. Uh, this is um, not not one cell, but some many many cells under the microscope. And we also connect our peptide with this fluorescent uh, reporter. And you can see um, our technology really have very uh, significantly high uh, cell up cell entry uh, comparing to the one that's used in, uh, in the uh, uh, that's that's the, the one that's used by um, uh, NO, NO, which is the uh, leading company in this in this area. And um, the, also, uh, we continued uh, our development in preclinical phase. So we run uh, many animal studies. This is just one that I'm showing you today. Um, this we use uh, again our peptide drug conjugate. We conjugate our peptide onto a drug that's already known. So what you see here on the left is uh, a tumor bearing uh, mouse treated by the original drug, um, and you can see uh, the tumor is uh, very big. Uh, the bird, the tumor burden is very um, uh, significant, and poor mouse really have a huge uh, tumor size right here. But when uh, the uh, when the mice were treated by our uh, PBC, uh, you can see how uh, how much they really shrink, um, and we think this is very uh, uh, promising. And we believe uh, our technology and our uh, peptide drug conjugate candidates can really uh, help a lot of patients in the future. So we're, this is one of the program we are running right now. And um, this just a, a quick slide show you how our uh, platform technology work. Um, at the very beginning, when I explained to you um, our uh, ecosystem, I mentioned that we use our platform technology as a service. Um, it can be the service might be a limiting word actually because it can really be more than a service. We use our platform to collaborate with um, partners. Uh, they can be from uh, uh, academic or uh, from industry. So basically we um, have their drug candidates or even, um, well, these candidates can be early candidates or um, some uh, already marketed drugs but have some problems. And we use our pla uh, screening platform to see whether our peptides uh, can help them. We have a library of peptides that have different properties, different uh, functions. And if we find some, uh, very uh, promising candidates. We will uh, uh, pr proceed and to see to test them in some in vitro and in vivo assays. And from this process, we will be able to generate some new uh, uh, new IP belong to uh, based on our agreement. Maybe it belongs to our partners or uh, we are co inventors So this is a very important part of our company. We our uh, technology platform can continuously generate new. Uh, intellectual property. And then the uh, step three will be the commercialization uh, phase. So um, this, was, this will also be depend on the agreement between the, part, uh, the partners. Uh, and uh, all of these are uh, really um, uh, can, cannot be done without the, uh, the team. So this is just uh, 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 who we are actually. So this is myself. Uh, the CEO and co-founder, and my co-founder is, uh, oops, sorry, Professor Paul Winder from Stanford University. Uh, he is um, the leading expert and a very well-known uh, organic chemist, uh, medicinal chemist uh, uh, in the world. And um, my team also have all these uh, expertise in uh, medicinal chemistry, drug conjugate chemistry, uh, pharmacology, DNPK, and every so we have a very well-rounded team, and we continue to make innovative uh, uh, inventions uh, to our technology. So I think this is how we will uh, exceed uh, 
among other among other peers. And um, this is uh, this is uh, just uh, um, what we have right now. Uh, just an example of how our therapeutic program will run. As we mentioned from our platform, we will generate therapeutic program. And uh, the one that we have um, in our pipeline and that which will be um, submitted for IND next year is really uh, something that's from a collaboration with Stanford University. We are, um, as we are a small out from Stanford University. We have, uh, we have, um, Obtain the ex exclusive IP licensing from Stanford, and then we continued with some uh, preclinical development of the uh, candidates that we uh, licensed. And then um, in 2021, which is next year, we will be um, move forward to continue to this uh, uh, investigational new drug application. And of course, follow that, uh, we will uh, plan the clinical trial and the new drug application. Um, okay, just a quick summary of what we have uh, in our pipeline program. The human oncology program is the one that's most uh, advanced right now, which is the one uh, in collaboration with Stanford. But again, with our platform, we continue to generate more candidates and we anticipate one to two IND candidates uh, each year. And we also have a topical uh, therapeutic program because our uh, uh, technology can, uh, can do uh, can cross the skin barrier and to deliver something over there. Um, and also we are looking, we are working on veterinary on oncology because this is a really, um, some, there, are, there are a lot of unmet uh, medical needs in this area as well. Um, myself uh, personally also had a, a love, lo uh, loved uh, family member, which was uh, my uh, two dogs, they passed away because of cancer. So I think um, I really uh, understand that um, uh, this market is is really in need for something new. Um, and also we are um, in partnership with uh, some other uh, companies we are working on some non-therapeutic program to really kind of expand the scope of our technology and help more people. Uh, and here is just uh, some uh, <laughs> summary of our characteristics. We have uh, the leadership, innovation, compassion. We're very enthusiastic about our science about our technology and we believe really this will bring some change to the drug development uh, world because we can shorten development time, cut the cost and really uh, bring a lot of innovative uh, power in this field. Um, and uh, next stage, we are uh, looking to raise more money to continue our uh, development. And also we are seriously looking into a partnership um, so if any of you are interested, uh, just feel free to contact me. We can, I'd love to have a chat and to, uh, yeah, to have a conversation to see if there's anything uh, we can work together or just anything we can talk about. Uh, and here is my contact. Thank you very much. I'd love Thank to you, answer questions. Thank you, Janice. It's really a wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions? I think I know a lot of the, the audience are from this industry. Some of them are my friends, actually. I, I think they have some questions. If no, I'll start it. Uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, you talk about the, the, the peptide uh, conjugate. So actually links to the to small molecules only or uh, both small, small molecule and antibodies. And uh, uh, that's my first question. So how how do you choose which part it, it's uh, conjuncted with, it, it, it linked to, and uh, and uh, how do you like compare the potency before and uh, after the, the conjugation? So uh, basically we can uh, actually co uh, con conjugate or use our peptide uh, tran transporter in Many different um, structure. Um, some sometimes we can we can conjugate it to uh, small molecules uh, and peptide drugs, and sometimes even protein drugs. This all this will all be accomplished by a linker, 
so we have uh, also a library of different linkers that can be, uh, you know, modified and really optimized uh, based on what we wanted to deliver. Uh, so this might probably answer your first question that um, the way we select um, uh, what we contribute to it is uh, somewhat, it's, it's quite flexible. It just depends on what's needed. Um, yeah. And, um, and then uh, the second question is how we uh, test uh, the efficacy after we make the contribution, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so it's, um, uh, so, so after we make the conjugation, usually the conjugate, the PDC will maintain the, um, the, or we, we may, usually we test them in, in parallel to uh, the original drug that's, um, that we pick. Uh, in most uh, first uh, cellular assays, um, we compare for if, if it is an oncology drug, we compare them in, uh, uh, in uh, like cancer cell lines and we'll just see whether they still have, uh, whether they, what, how the efficacy compare. And most of the time that we will see a, a very a significant improvement uh, in the uh, efficacy. And also we compare them in uh, resistant cells. Usually um, we know uh, chemo chemotherapy drugs, um, uh, after uh, the patient use it for, for some time, they will, uh, per they will uh, have resistant problems and there are many resistant cell lines and uh, we also uh, resist cell lines available uh, uh, commercially and we test them in those. And also we have a partnership uh, at Stanford Hospital and hospitals um, in China that we would be able to um, per, uh, process some of the uh, human uh, samples that the tumor that being, that's uh, removed from patients and uh, we collect their uh, uh, their uh, tissue and uh, isolate some cells and we compare it in those. So these are the quite simple in vitro testing that can be done very fast. So uh, after we run this this the drug uh, with our uh, peptides and transporters to, to make several candidates, then we test the in them. This can be a very fast process overall. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, you can just unmute yourself and ask Greg, please. Uh, ju sorry, just uh, uh, to add to what I just said, um, all these in vitro assets, we usually do it um, uh, within our company. And then we have collaborators that we run animal models with. Um, I think that that gives more, um, I, like, more data to compare the conjugates with the original drug. But overall, all, um, uh, I think, um, from what we see, we have tested several classes of uh, drugs uh, to make our uh, PDCs. And we think uh, the transporter really help uh, many of them improve in efficacy and also uh, reduce the systemic toxicity when we do animal model. Yeah, the reason I ask the question is because the penetration is a main problem for almost all solid tumor drugs. In Especially yes. for those big um, molecular weight drugs like antibodies, for small molecules, probably better. But if you solve that problem, it's going to be a huge improvement. Uh, even though I, I, I think that the, the conjugation into different um, domain of the protein is actually very important. Sometimes the, 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 the compound or the protein is very sensitive. If you just uh, put on something random on site, it's very uh, less likely to have every protein to be more potency. So, so uh, I, I'm asking probably another way to for that is, what is the rate uh, for an unsuccessful conjugation? It can be 100% all improve the efficacy. Um, you know that, I know that. So I just uh, need to have an answer, like how many percent that the compound or the antibody is less potency, for example, half, half or what? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I think that's a very good question and really down to earth. Um, so basically, I think um, you are right, not 100% of the conjugate really work. That's why we have the screening uh, platform that we need to find which is the best one. And what, from our experience, we, um, we have conjugated um, uh, chemotherapy drugs, um, like 
uh, cancer drugs and antibody drugs and protein drugs. Um, basically, what we see is that some, it really depends on uh, what which conjugation site you select. Uh, there, there are times that we make, make the conjugation and it lost the um, activity completely. So that's telling us that this is, this is not a, a good site to, uh, to conjugate. And because we have a very strong chemistry background, so we basically just uh, try a different site. And what um, I think, um, I think we have a pretty good successful read after making many, uh, making effort, after um, putting effort in making uh, the conjugation right. So uh, right now we have done, I'd say six, to 10 tests for different drugs and all of them were were good but i don't i don't i don't i don't think this is uh, a proof for 100% successful rate because this is not there's nothing 100% i think uh, it really depends on what the uh, candidate is and especially for the, the protein drugs like antibody drugs you you said uh, i think we still have a lot of work to do on that and uh, the one uh, uh, these companies over here on Trada, they are specifically doing biologic, uh, delivering bi uh, large biologics using uh, these penetrating peptides. And uh, I mean, they are uh, still slowly developing their, their, their work. So uh, I say like developing a big antibody drug is still challenging. And we, uh, in our company, we are, our program is still in very early phase. We don't uh, have something very mature to share right now. Um, but I think we will have a probably lower successful rate with the, uh, large biologics delivery. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Hang on back. I, I John, you're back. <laughs> okay. You got it soft? Great. Yeah, I'm all set. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Janice. Uh, really, really nice talk and uh, really nice uh, q and I think. Uh, it solved a lot of problems with this uh, huge success. Uh, good luck. Thank and you. We'll also much. keep an Thank eye you. on it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, right, John. Um, are, are, are you able to solve this problem? If no, you, you can probably just present it without this one. Let me go and see. Wait a minute now. Ah, I went into <laughs> screen sharing. Wait a minute now. But where? is my PowerPoint. <laughs> now the PowerPoint's gone. Oh, brother. All right. Damn. Yeah, you, yeah I, 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 I didn't see you send the email to me with the- I, I, No, I, I, I put it on myself. I was all set to go. And now, there it is. Okay, here we go. Okay. Can you see it? No. You got to no? no, you got to click the share screen. I did. And, and, and click the PowerPoint. There are different categories. If you are using a Mac, it says top desktop one, whiteboard, something else, oh. like Google Chrome, something else. You need to click the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, there you go. There, do you see it? Uh, okay. Here double, is double, double click it. Can you see it? No. <laughs> uh... It's fine. You know what, John? Uh, can you just present without the slice? I think it's fine. We well, all understand it. It's, it's really too bad because. No problem. No problem. I mean, wait a minute now. Let's see if I can go back. I, yeah, I'm meeting him. Did you? Yeah, okay. Let's go see if I can get back to you. You don't have the, uh, I mean, I can join your meeting, but <laughs> that, that I'm already in it. No problem, John. I, I mean, you can just go ahead and present. It's fine. It's fine. I mean, uh, um, well, I'm almost thinking, would it be better to come back another day when I can, when I've got it all sorted out? <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I mean, yeah. Uh, do you have a, a, an ID meeting? I mean, do you ID have an ID? Do you have a password? No. No, you don't have a password. 
See, that's what's really messed us up. Damn. Okay. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Because there I've got the PowerPoint on my screen. Do you want me to share anything for you? Um, for the... Wait a minute, let me, now I've got you all the way. I'm on, why, let's see if I can. Okay, here we go. I've got share screen, now I, I uh, click that. And click the PowerPoint. Uh, and then PowerPoint, right? Yes. And then click share. Okay. Right bottom, there's a share button, blue. Yeah, I've got that right bottom. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I pushed the wrong button. No, wait a minute. Okay, can you you can't see it still? You can't see it. Fudge. Okay. Let me get put this down. There I am. <laughs> oh, brother. This is a uh, turning into. You see, here's the problem. I'm working on strange computers down where I am. All right, here we go. I say share screen. And I push PowerPoint down at the bottom, right? Yes. No, no, no. You, you just click the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is open right now, right? Right, yeah. Then you just click it over the share screen button. You click the share screen button, then find the PowerPoint. There it is. And click share. And click what? Share. share. Okay. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> you see it? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Holy mackerel. We got it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Full screen. So we're going to go a little bit over, I'm afraid. Is that okay? No problem. No problem. All right. Here we go. All right. Well, let's just go back to where I was. And uh, all right. So I want. I said that I. What I would do is, is is talk about the the fovea. So this is a the cross section of an eye, and everybody's familiar with that. Of course, the light comes in through the cornea, focus uh, by the lens onto the retina, which lines the back of the eye. Oh, jeepers creepers! All right. <laughs> I don't think I can go back. Wait a minute, let's see if I can go back. Can I go back? No, previous. All right, all right, all right. Here's the fovea. All of our high resolution vision. <laughs> I'm now so, it is mediated by this little bit of retina here. It's only about 1% of the area of the entire retina but it mediates all of our high acuity vision. Now, what we're gonna be concerned with in this talk and, uh, is the retina itself and then the cells that overlie the retina, the pigment epithelium. And they, turned out, they turn out to be very crucial uh, in age-related macular degeneration. If we look outside the, ret the, uh, the fovea, this is what a piece of human retina looks like. The most distal cells are the rods and cones, and we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail later. The outer segments are where the light sensitive pigments are. The inner segments contain all of the uh, cytosolic uh, apparatus in the eye. And then from the inner segment, there, oh, jeepers, creepers, there is a long process that connects with the synaptic terminals for the photoreceptors. Now, why? are the synaptic terminals displaced from the inner and outer segments. And the reason is, we'll be looking at in the next slide, but the inner layers of the retina, all of these layers are swept aside in the fovea so that the light can impinge more directly on the photoreceptors. But another point I should make very quickly is that in addition in the retina, besides the photoreceptors, there are four other classes of cells that start the process uh, of the analysis of the visual image. So the photoreceptors connect with two types of cells, bipolar cells and horizontal cells. The horizontal cells are inhibitory neurons that interact in the outer retina. The bipolar cells carry the visual message from the outer to the inner retina. 
And there they come into synaptic contact with two classes of cells, amacrine cells, which are like horizontal cells in that they mediate um, interactions in the inner retina, complex interactions such as motion detection. The bipolar cells also connect with the ganglion cells the ganglion cell axons run along the surface of the retina, collect at the optic disc, and form the optic nerve. Now, the next slide shows the fovea itself, okay? The indented area. So the light can impinge more directly on the photoreceptors. And our high acuity is mediated by these very central, why do I keep pushing that? Very central photoreceptors they're all cones. They have very long outer segments. These are the inner segments. These are their nuclei. And then these are their axons that go to the uh, terminals of the cells. You see how they're displaced very far from where the inner and outer segments are. The, the central region of the retina has no rods. The rods don't start until you get over here approximately. And there are a couple of other specializations that are worthwhile pointing out with regard to the fovea of the eye. On the left is a, 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 a picture, a adaptive optics picture of the central retina. And the fovea is right here. Notice that there are no blue cones in the fovea. Why? Because blue light, of course, is refracted more than is red and green light. And so if you had blue cones here, the image would be somewhat smudged. The center of the fovea, our high acuity region, is more easily visualized in this picture here, which is from a colorblind person who has lost all of his red cones. So all he has is green cones, which fill the center of the fovea, and then the blue cones, which are outside. And indeed, you don't begin to see rods until you get about out here. Okay, now, the importance of the fovea is shown beautifully in this slide, which measures the acuity away from the fovea. And you see at the very center of the fovea, the acuity is very high, but then it falls off extraordinarily quickly. This is the blind spot. That's where the axons of the ganglion cells exit the eye. You can show this yourself by simply um, looking at your two index finger fingernails, okay? If you look at the one on the left and now you move your hand just an inch away or the, 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 uh, uh, the, the finger an inch away, you'll notice that you lose all the detail of what's on your fingernail on the left. It just shows just a short little distance down here, you reduce visual acuity by such an enormous amount. Okay. Now, there's another feature of the central retina that turns out to be very important in age-related macular degeneration, and it's the following. This, this is looking at the spatial density of rods and what it shows is that right around the central fovea, which contains no rods, just cones, and we've talked about that mainly to begin with, we see a, the highest density of rods in the entire retina. So if we look at it in radial section, here's the fovea. We're not showing any cones, but they would be look something like this all the way down to the to the bottom. And here we go, my yeah, and. Uh, here is the enormous concentration of rods right around the central fovea. And why that's important is that if you start looking at the sensitivity of the retina across this region here, of course, you're recording rods here and in the center cones. It turns out that where you see the first changes in sensitivity is here in the rod region. And that can be measured by a technique called microperimetry, which is shown over on the right in this picture here of a fundus photograph. And these little squares indicate the micro analysis of the sensitivity of the various regions. So the rods, which are out here, are the first to lose sensitivity. 
the cones hold their sensitivity for some time and then they begin to show a loss. And so what we now believe, and this is the major tenant of <laughs> our approach, is that the central foveal cones are not the first to show changes, but it's the rods. And it's because of the great number of rods that we find just outside the fovea. Okay, now here's what's going on in AMD. Here is a healthy retina. It's upside down from the retinas I've showed you before. So the main part of the retina is going in this direction. These are the outer segments. In this case, we're showing mainly rods. There's a cone here. And the point is, is that the photoreceptors are an intimate con uh, connection, interact with the pigment epithelial cells. The retinal pigment epithelial cells play a very important role in maintaining the photoreceptors. And we'll get to that in a minute. So that retinal photoreceptors require healthy RPE cells for metabolic support. And also even more important is that they require the pigment epithelial cells to help them maintain their visual pigment, the light sensitive pigment in the outer segments. Now there are two forms of AMD. It begins in the dry form in which the first clinical signs of AMD are inclusions that appear in the pigment epithelial cells at a time that the photoreceptor outer segments still look pretty good. And these inclusions are lipofusin, which is really a term just for junk that the cells haven't been able to deal with appropriately. And if these get to be in sufficient numbers, then what happens is that this material is secreted and then material appears between the pigment epithelial cells and the beginning of the vascular layer that is below the pigment epithelial cells. And these are called drusen. Okay, in about 10 to 15% of the cases of dry AMD, and for the most part, vision is maintained reasonably well in dry AMD, in dry AMD for a number of years. But then what tends to happen is that it, it transitions to a second, much more virulent form of AMD called wet AMD, in which you get neovascular growth into the retina, which completely destroys not only the pigment epithelium, but the photoreceptor cells themselves. So about 10% to 15% of the patients with dry AMD progress to this uh, wet AMD, and that's when then vision really deteriorates. Fortunately, we have a way to slow down AMD. It doesn't cure the disease, it doesn't stop the dry AMD, but what it does is stop the neovascular growth. And this is with anti-VEGF, uh, uh, drugs, which will stop the neovascular growth. So one can stop it today at the dry AMD level, but you're not stopping the disease. And that, of course, is what we really want to do. Okay, let's go back now and talk more about photoreceptors and what we think is causing the pigment epithelium to be poisoned. And then for the loss of the photoreceptors. I've already mentioned that there are four types of photoreceptors in the human eye. Three cones, they're the white lines, a blue sensitive cone, green sensitive cone, and then a red sensitive cone, which actually absorbs maximally in the yellow region of the spectrum, but it mediates all our red vision that you can see here. Then the rods, which uh, are of only one type, then they absorb maximally right here in the green region of the spectrum. They let through red light and they let through some blue light. So that if one looked at this visual pigment, what you would see is something that looks quite purple. All right? And that's important as we'll, we'll see in just a moment. So three types of cones, they mediate color vision, one type of rod mediates dim light vision. 
Now here again is a blow up of rods and cones in the human retina somewhat away from the fovea. Here's a cone, here's a rod. We don't need to spend time looking at this. Now what the outer segment look like in the electron microscope is something like this. And that is that there is a series of membranous discs that extend all across the outer segment. And in these membranous discs are packed molecule after molecule after molecule of visual pigment. This happens to be a rod. So the visual pigment here in these membranes is rhodopsin. In cones, it can be either the uh, blue sensitive, green sensitive, or red sensitive pigment. They're, each photoreceptor type is separate with regard to the light sensitive pigment that it contains. But the point is, is that the molecules of visual pigment are so densely packed in these membranes that if you take a photoreceptor or a retina out of an animal, you can see the color of the visual pigment in most cases. This, for example, is the retina from a frog. A frog has, is very rod dominated. It has very few cones. So in the dark, what it looks like is this. It has this reddish purplish color due to the visual pigment rhodopsin. One can extract the visual pigment and uh, with detergents, it's a membrane protein. So you need a detergent and you get a solution that looks like this. Okay, that was, this was discovered back in the 1880s uh, by a man by the name of Bowl. But then uh, these color changes that occur in the retina when they're exposed to light was taken up by a very famous biochemist of the day, Willie Kuna, who discovered among other things, the main muscle protein, myosin. And what he showed very nicely is that if you take a dark adapted retina that has the visual purple color, this happens to be a little bit of the pigment epithelium. I'll talk more about that in, in a few minutes. Okay, this is the color due to the rod visual pigment. If you now expose the eye to light, the visual purple color disappears and you end up with a retina that is very yellow. He talked about this as the visual purple stage. The first stage of what we call bleaching is the visual yellow stage. That, also, that pigment can also be extracted and you get a solution that looks like this. This is a photochemical reaction. It requires light. But now if you allow retinas in the visual yellow stage just to sit around, gradually the yellow color disappears and you end up with a retina that has no color in it, the visual white stage. This is a solution from a bleached and uh, final stage of the color changes that occur in the retina. Okay. From that, Kuna then developed the first, what we call visual cycle. So you start with in the dark adapted rod, visual purple. Light changes visual, <coughs> visual yellow. That's the photochemical reaction. Visual yellow will gradually lose all the color and become visual white. Now what Kuna showed was that if you took a fresh retina, bleached it from visual purple to visual yellow, put it back in the dark, some of the pigment would regenerate. And from that, he concluded that, it's, that you can go back to visual purple retinas from visual yellow, but not from visual white. Okay, so what's going on here biochemically? Well, this is the work that George Wall, my mentor, who won a Nobel Prize for this work, worked out. It had been shown by the beginning of the 20th century that vitamin A was very critical for vision. In fact, it was, had been known for thousands of years that there was a dietary factor that was required for good vision. Indeed, that was shown way back in the ancient Egyptian papyri who showed 
that people, especially from the countryside and in the winter when nutrition was not very good, that many people became very less sensitive to light. It was called night blindness. They had already discovered back then how to cure it. And that was to make the person who was night blind or give them some raw liver from a cow or from a horse or wherever. Why that was curative is because that's where vitamin A is stored in the body. Now, it was known then by the beginning of the 20th century with the, begin, with the um, discovery of the vitamins that what was in the liver was vitamin A and that was what was curative for night blindness. So Wall did his classic experiment in the 30s in which what he did was he took retinas in the visual white stage, the last stage of bleaching, and he extracted them with a very um, mild organic solvent. And when he did that, what he found was in these retinas, there was abundant vitamin A. And he also found that there was an abundant protein, a protein which equaled for the most part, the amount of vitamin A in the, in the retina. Now, when he extracted retinas in the visual yellow stage with the weak organic solvent, he found another compound, he called it retinine, Today we call it retinal, and why that is, I'll tell you in a minute. The retinine, retinal, had many properties similar to vitamin A, but was clearly different. It was yellow, for example, where vitamin A is essentially colorless. So in the visual yellow stages, he found retinal and opsin. When he did the same experiment to retinas that were in the visual purple stage, with a mild organic solvent, he found nothing, neither retinine nor vitamin A. But then if what he did was extract visual purple retinas with a stronger organic solvent, for example, chloroform, which denatures protein, he then found that in the visual purple retinas, he could find retinine or retinal. What he concluded that meant was that retinal was bound to opsin and as long as the opsin was intact, you would stay in the visual purple stage. But once you denatured opsin, the retinal could be released. Okay, this is the structure of vitamin A, all right? An ion and ring here, long chain of alternating single and double bonds, and the molecule ends with an alcoholic group. What was discovered after Wall's early work identifying retinal and retinine was that what retinine and retinal are is the aldehyde form of vitamin A, alcohol aldehyde. So that then was the precursor everybody thought for making a visual pigment. You need retinal and opsin. But then it turned out, and this turned out to be a very interesting story, it wasn't any retinal but one isomeric form of retinal. That is, as I'm sure all of you in the audience know, when you have single double bonds, they can rotate, at least if you're a sick bond, bond, but not if you're a double bond. And therefore, if you make one of these uh, bonds here go from being trans to cis, and I'm not gonna go into that in detail, you make a bend of the molecule. The molecule bends. And indeed, what turned out to be the case is that it's one bent form of retinal that makes all the visual pigments. It's called the 11 cis form because of the numbering of the carbon atoms. So here now is where we are today in understanding the visual cycle. Again, our example is rhodopsin, but this holds also for the cone visual pigments. But let's talk about rhodopsin. All right, that's visual purple in the dark adapted photoreceptor. Light then breaks down rhodopsin into 
all trans retinal, that is retinal, that has all trans bonds, no cis bonds, and opsin. And in fact, that's all that light does at vision. And that is to cause the isomerization of the 11 cis retinal. And that allows the release of all trans retinal, which, which is isomerized by the light and the release of opsin, which then begins to undergo conformational changes. And uh, when it undergoes the conformational changes, that leads to the excitation of the photoreceptors. Now, you release then from bleached rhodopsin all trans retinal, that gets converted to all trans vitamin A. It's a reduction. You go from aldehyde to alcohol. Interestingly enough, that occurs in the pigment epithelium. So it's all trans retinal and the pigment epithelium, which is where the vitamin A now gets isomerized to the 11 cis form. This moves back into the retina and the retin all, the vitamin A gets, uh, gets oxidized to the 11 cis retinal. That will combine spontaneously with opsin to reform rhodopsin. So this is the example of why the pigment epithelium is so important in the visual cycle and in vision. And if the pigment epithelium gets poisoned, then of course, vision will be extraordinarily compromised. Okay, here now is sort of a very simplified summary of what I've talked about so far. Rhodopsin in the light breaks down to retinal and opsin. And then when the retinal is the right isomer, it gets reformed into rhodopsin. Now aldehydes are very reactive molecules. That's long been known. And what is the case is that when you bleach rhodopsin, releasing retinal, what happens is that most of the retinal is sequestered by proteins in the outer segments. But a small amount of it appears to escape. Maybe 10 or 20% of it stays free in the outer segment. And this we think is the bad actor. That is this free retinal because of its aldehyde terminal group forms easily shift bases with a whole variety of molecules in the outer segment forming in many cases what are called bisretinoids that are very toxic. And one of them is called A2E. It's a molecule that is formed from retinol and phosphatidylethanolamine, one of the lipids in the outer segments. Here is how that happens. All trans retinol then interacts with phosphatidylethanolamine and ultimately forms then A2E, I won't go through all the steps, involves two molecules of retinol and uh, the, the, retin the ethanolamine. Phosphatidic comes off and so on and so forth. But it turns out that this is a very, very toxic molecule. And indeed it's been shown, uh, okay, let me go back. It has been shown that A2E it destroys lysosomes in the uh, pigment epithelium. What happens is that the free retinol, as, it's, as it moves into the pigment epithelium, and it's in the pigment epithelium that the A2E is formed. And then it's been shown, and all of these steps have been shown, that the A2P inhibits lysosomes by inhibiting proton pumps, changes the pH, uh, it, it inhibits the acid hydrolases and so on and so forth, leading then to lipofusin formation because the lysosomes have been poisoned. And li lipofusin itself can be toxic. That leads to RPE regeneration, the formation of drusen and so on and so forth. 
and that re results ultimately in photoreceptor degeneration. So with all of this as background, what we decided to do was to try to find targets for free retinol that would bind free retinol and that we then could prevent A2E and other bisretinoids from forming. Okay, and what happens is that the aldehydes readily form, as I mentioned a minute ago, these shift bases with a whole host of molecules. But what we designed were molecules that would bind or trap the retinaldehyde by once they form the shift base, a, a, a cyclic compound would be formed that was irreversible. In a way, we were taking the, um, an example of how uh, retinaldehyde, retinal, interacts with phosphatidylethanolamine, forming a ring compound here that makes this a very stable molecule, especially after the phosphatidic acid gets, gets uh, 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 hydrolyzed off. So that was our rationale, free retinol. We designed then a series of compounds that would then bind the retinol irreversibly. We tested a number of them and found one, we called it NS2, Neuron Systems 2, because it seemed to be relatively non-toxic, could be broken down in intact lysosomes and so on and so forth. Okay, that is the rationale for our, our um, starting a company. So what we did was we approached venture capitalists and we formed a company in 2006. We had a number of milestones that we were expected to accomplish. And we did accomplish all of those in the time frame that we were given. We were able to synthesize the compounds with the lead compound being NS2. We tried the, these compounds in mice where they had accumulated a fair amount of A2E. What happens is that A2E gradually accumulates with age in all mammalian photoreceptors, probably also in non-mammalian photoreceptors as well. So it seemed to do the job we wanted it to do to get rid of the A2E. We then looked at the safety profile, which was quite good. And when we tried to see if by binding this free retinol, we affected the visual cycle, i.e. vision at all, we could show that it did not. We were just getting rid of this toxic aldehyde that formed these bisretinoids that were very damaging to the pigment epithelium, but we kept the visual cycle intact. We then went on to a phase one study and it was very successful. We could show that it had almost no toxicity in humans, no problem in terms of altering the visual cycle and vision. So it all looked very, very promising. However, unbeknownst to us, our VCs had two issues that they were very worried about. And they didn't discuss this with us and that was a problem. And I'm gonna to get to that in a few minutes. That is, we had proposed that the way we apply our drugs to the, uh, and get it into the eye was to do it topically. And the VCs consulted a number of ophthalmologists who said, oh, you can't get any drugs in through this, the outer eye but they were thinking always cornea. And indeed the sclera, the white part of the eye is much more permeable to drugs than is the cornea. But the ophthalmologists were just insistent. There was no way you could get a drug into the back of the eye by putting it on topically. Despite our having evidence from animal studies, particularly studies we had done in zebrafish 
that it was very easy to get very large drugs into the eye, assuming that you put it on the sclera rather than the cornea. The other point was that they were very worried about how long it would take us to show the effects in humans of blocking the free retinal. They estimated it would be several years. And they had a point because studies that had been done on potential therapies and looking at changes in the, in the retina always were simply measuring lesions that were caused in or that resulted in dry AMD. And that took usually 24 months or more to show. But we, in thinking about it, went back to microperimetry and said, look, microperimetry is much, much more sensitive than looking at lesion size. And we started working with a, an, a German and Italian company to develop a new instrument, microperimetry instrument that will sense particularly changes in rod sensitivity. We were just about ready to complete all the study with the microperimetry. And when we arrived at a meeting of our VCs, what they did was they said, We're, we don't feel that going on from this makes sense from our point of view. And they essentially fired us. They let us go, which is not something that is that uncommon when you're dealing with VCs. But anyway, um, when we argued against them, they said, no, their minds were made up and that they were going to move in a different direction. So what they did was once they got rid of us, Tom as president and myself as the chief scientific officer, they changed the name of the company and they decided to use our molecules to um, uh, attack diseases that involve inflammation, including dry eye, that is when the eye become somewhat inflamed. And that's a huge problem for many people, but also skin diseases, ichthyosis of the skin and so on and so forth. So we were, we, they've been at it now for about five years. They haven't gotten anywhere, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I would say in, in both of those comments. Um, so uh, where we are is that we then went back and started designing new compounds. But of course they had all the intellectual property of the idea and so on and so forth. And so we had very little uh, area in which to work. So we made some compounds, we presented them to other VCs, to pharma and so on and so forth. But they all felt that indeed the boat had sailed with regard to that approach and so we've never been able to get funding to continue on with the study. So um, it, it was very frustrating. And uh, today, what would I say are the, the lessons to be learned from our experience? I think the first lesson we were very successful at, and that is to have a clear and compelling scientific rationale for the approach that we were proposing. I do think it's still the best idea out there, but we've never been able to test it to the extent that we would like in humans. Here's where now I think we made a few mistakes. And this is uh, advice that I'm giving to all of you people who are just starting new startups. And that is, I think it's important to have credible non-related experts as part of your team. We didn't do that. I'm a basic scientist. Tom was a basic scientist. What we didn't do is to have expert ophthalmologists or people who knew things that we didn't know. So for example, I think if we had had such experts and had been able to show them that indeed a topical application of our drug was feasible, that would have eliminated one of the ma major objections that they had. 
And we didn't really let them in on the fact that we were designing a new instrument to measure rod sensitivity, a new micro perimeter. Uh, and so by the time we talked about all of this, the boat had sailed. So I, I recommend to all of you that, especially if you're a basic scientist, it's probably a good idea to get a credible MD a specialist, as far as our situation was concerned, probably an ophthalmologist involved with the program. And that we didn't do. The second thing I think to say is that it's really important when you are being supported, particularly by venture capital people, is to understand them better than we did with ours. What are their motives? Of course, it's to make money but I think you have to make it very clear to them how long it's going to take, what's required and so on and so forth. And I'm not sure we did as good a job there as we could have. It's also important that they have a clear understanding of the major issues as you go along. And that again, I think was a failure of ourselves. And that is we did not keep our investors as informed as we should have. And uh, I think it's very important then, if you do get funding from a VC and you're working alone, essentially, that you keep the investors very deeply involved. Okay, well, that's my story. Again, I think that the rationale for what we tried to do, it was done, it was made a lot of sense. In fact, I think, still think it's the best ideas that we have for, for, for dry AMD because no one's come up with anything similar since. Um, and, but I do think why we failed was that we did not work effectively enough with our investors. Okay, let me leave it there. I, uh, and I'm sorry that we had so much difficulty with, <laughs> with no problem. Eventually we found out. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, John. It's a great, great talk. Not only on the scientific point of view, it's a great story, but also your um, story on the startup, including um, some failures you, you, you had and some, some challenges you had. And all, of course, there are a lot of uh, experience you had, uh, good or bad. I think it's all resources for, for us, for, um, for, 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 for any of the scientific background companies. Um, it's it's a, it's a really a pleasure to 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 listen to all of those experience from your side. Uh, is there any questions for um, either scientific or from the entrepreneurship point of view? Um, I have different questions actually. So first one is uh, is. Um, related to the RPE. So, so actually, uh, John, for the, for the RPE, for, for the A2E, it's, uh, it's uh, it, um, I mean, naturally it's going to the RPE lysosome. And once it's conjuncted with the drug, uh, if I remember correctly, it's one drug uh, with two free uh, uh, retinos, is that right? And, and if it's conjuncted, where it goes, it goes to the autophagosome, it goes to the lysosome directly, it went through the autophagy, what is the downstream for uh, the, the, the junctions after, afterwards? I'm not quite sure I understand the question is, you know, what we were able to show is that we could reduce A2E, which is probably the most prominent of the bis retinoids that causes problems in, in the, in the uh, uh, mouse retina. This is a disadvantage of a mouse retina in that even as A2E accumulates to very high levels, the photoreceptors don't degenerate very much. So it was very hard to do histology and prove that indeed we were protecting the uh, photoreceptors from the damage uh, caused by A2E. Uh, it may very well be that the, you know, that the, uh, uh, foveal cones uh, are more sensitive to A2E than, for example, rods. And that could be the answer because, of course, 
the mouse doesn't have a fovea, but we don't know that. You know, it yeah. would have been nice to be able to work with a small fovea animal to do these studies, like a marmoset. But uh, at that point, uh, that wasn't possible. I mean, part of the question is where where the compound goes, the synthesized compound uh, conjunction with the with the. You mean the you um, mean the, the compounds that yeah trapped. Yeah, yeah. Tra trapped A2E, and then where it goes. It goes to the lysosome. Where did they go? Lysosome. Actually, as long as there are intact lysosomes in good shape, they will break down those compounds. Okay. And so it essentially gets rid of the, uh, yeah. We could show that, and indeed in culture, that uh, as long as you had intact lysosomes, it would break down those toxic compounds. Another question would be with the A2E, um, if there's no treatment, the cells goes to apoptosis, right? Is yeah, that right? what happens is that the, uh, you know, the, you poison the, the pigment epithelial cells and they begin to degenerate. And I would assume it's mainly an apoptotic degeneration. But as they degenerate, then no longer can the pigment epithelial cells make the 11 cis retinal, which is critical for regenerating visual pigment. But the pigment epithelial cells plays other roles as well. So for example, something that really doesn't relate to our studies, but is a fact, is that outer segments of both the rods and the cones are turning over all the time. Uh, every morning you lose a, a group of discs from the outer segments which then have to be phagocytized by the pigment epithelium and digested. So uh, the pigment epithelium plays that role. And then it also plays a role in, uh, of course, uh, uh, in metabolism in that all, almost all of the oxygen and all of the nutrients for the photoreceptors come from the pigment epithelium, usually from the choroid, which is the next layer over, which is a highly vascular layer, then that's where the oxygen and the metabolites come from. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Actually, I have some other questions, but I'm gonna save some time for others. Uh, are there any other questions? If no, i probably ask one more question. Sure. Um, so for, uh, for, the, for the drug delivery, actually, it's, it's, uh, it's also a part of the issue from the back of the eye, especially, I think it's um, kind of hard to penetrate. It actually, it's related to, to the first startup in one life. I, I don't know if you, you hear them or no. So the penetration to the eye is actually probably the easiest way in the whole body for the drug delivery compared with the uh, BBB, compared with the tumor. So is there any like PKPD down in the back of the eye for the drug delivery afterwards. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you're you're really asking about how to get the drug in. Yes. Right. Yeah. And you know, we we thought about a lot of approaches, putting a patch on the sclera that would slowly release the the drug. Of course, we did consider injecting the drug into Directly. the eye. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, that's very damaging to an eye if you do it over and over again. And if you could do it externally, then you would have a much better opportunity for manipulating the level of drug to get into the eye. And so that was our thinking. We could also go, of course, to, uh, uh, you know, a pill. But of course, then you have lots of other problems because you're putting in, uh, you know, something that's yeah. blocking aldehydes and you don't know what all of the uh, <clears throat> complications will be. So, you know, we thought if we could get it in the eye uh, topically, then uh, that would be the best way. Uh, it should probably not ever say topically because that suggests we're putting it right <laughs> on the top of the eye in the corner. I got you. I got that you. is around the eye. And we thought <laughs> a lot about that. I still think that's the way to go. And, uh, you know, 
we did some experiments uh, a number of years ago, and I mentioned them very briefly, showing <coughs> how much more permeable the sclera is from the cornea. Okay. And in, and in fact, in some animals, you can get in quite large drugs, even larger than our drugs into the eye through the sclera. Okay, uh, my, my, my last quick question is where to buy horse liver? Where is? Where to buy horse liver? Like beef where? liver, chicken liver, all kinds of livers. Oh, any kind of liver, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just fact, curiosity. We're store vitamin A uh, to a huge degree in liver. And in fact, <laughs> if you read the exploits of Arctic explorers, what they found was that if you ate the liver of a polar bear, it has so much <laughs> okay, that's funny. It, that it's very toxic. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, huge amounts of vitamin A can get very toxic. Okay, yeah. that's funny. Okay, John, um, that's about it. Thanks, thanks a lot for your talk. And I think uh, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful evening for all of us. Um, so, uh, so, so thanks a lot uh, for all of you for, uh, for attending our uh, Accelerator program uh, this evening. Of course, we, we thank John uh, for, for joining us, even though there's some difficulties, but eventually we'll solve this all. Uh, yes. we, 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 saw, we, we solved the problem out. And thanks, um, uh, uh, Janice, for, for sharing the great story with us for N1 Life. And uh, thanks, thanks for everybody. So our, uh, if you have any further questions, you probably can get, uh, drop an email to me and, uh, and uh, we, we, can, we can further discuss about it. And also thanks all of the guys uh, out of the Zoom um, on, on some other platforms, YouTube, Facebook. And you guys have a great, great evening and a great holiday. Thank okay. you, John.